Okay, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for attending this week's Brown Bag Launch Seminar. And this week, we have uh, Sahat Patel uh, to give us a presentation first. Um, Sahat is a fifth year undergraduate student currently in his final semester. He has researched under Dr. Lacey uh, in the Space Systems Design Lab for seven semesters. He is currently working on the Lunar Flashlight Propulsion System, a green model propellant Proportion systems that also employs additive manufacturing for a customer design. He has completed the internships at NASA JPL, Blue Origin, and Icon System, and he will be interning at Blue Origin and SpaceX uh, after graduation today. Uh, he will discuss the development of a code gas thruster component test bed. So, hi, all yours. Thank you, Dr. Sun. Uh, so hi everyone, I'm Sahaj Patel and my presentation is on the development of a cold gas thruster component test bed. My research was conducted under Dr. Lightsey. Um, okay. So in my presentation, uh, first I'll give some background on what cold gas thrusters are and the work that we do with them in the Space Systems Design Lab. I'll break down the components of a cold gas system, discuss how we control the electronic valves in the system, and then establish the need for the test bed that was developed in my project. Going into the test bed itself, I'll first present the layout and design of the system, go into the hardware and the parts that we chose, uh, present the final hardware build, and then discuss how we operate and test using the system. And I'll go into the future steps. A note on the timeline of this project, we started it last fall and uh, designed and completed the hardware uh, in the middle of the spring semester. And then because of COVID, we had to stop the final integration and testing, so that'll be continued in the future. So uh, some background on what cold gas thrusters are. As we know, CubeSats are limited uh, in complexity and volume because of their nature. And because of this, propulsion options for CubeSats are also very limited. When there are propulsion needs for low Earth orbit or uh, other Earth orbiting CubeSat missions, these propulsion needs are relatively simple. They need station keeping maneuvers, some relative maneuvering for proximity operations or constellations, and sometimes attitude control. So while they're not very efficient, cold gas systems are extremely uh, simple. They simply involve the isotropic expansion of a gas through a converging diverging nozzle. And these systems offer low specific impulses on the order of 40 to 100 seconds. So in the Space Systems Design Lab, uh, we develop cold gas thrusters that are custom to def different missions and meet the needs of the small satellites or CubeSats at hand. We employ additive manufacturing using a nanocomposite structure 3D printed using stereolithography to manufacture the entire thruster as one structure. This allows us to develop a custom shape to optimize the available volume in the system. That way you're maximizing the propellant available and not being limited by the shape of commercial parts. The 3D printed structure also contains the tanks tubing and nozzles all in the, in the structure so you don't have additional hardware to integrate and you don't need to access the internals of the system. The propellant we use in these cold gas thrusters is a ref, uh, refrigerant called R236FA, which has a specific impulse of about 47 seconds in line with what I mentioned earlier. And there is one removable structure in these thrusters which we call the manifold. It's an additional component that allows the integration of external hardware so, which is the electronic solenoid valves that operate the thruster. So these valves will be integrated into a manifold and that'll sit on top of the thruster. I'll show that in the next picture. So just for reference, this is the BioSentinel uh, mission uh, cold gas thruster. It was developed in the lab a few years ago by uh, some of the grad students. So you can see that the bluish structure is the Acura Bluestone. That's the composite material we used to use. I think the materials changed, but we still use stuff with the same properties. So you can see that the uh, thruster, by and large, is printed as one structure. There's additional components uh, with the fill and drain valves, which are the metal uh, squares that are added on top, as well as the manifold, which sits in the middle right here with the valve sitting inside. And on top of that is the microprocessor that controls the thruster. And you can also see the two circles in the bottom left and bottom right corner. Those are actually the ends of the nozzles that are printed into the structure. So this is a cross-sectional view of the CAD of that biosentinel mission, uh, just to give you an idea of the components of a cold gas thruster. So in orange, we have the main tank. Um, these look like separate cavities, but note that since this is a cross-sectional view, that's the only reason you see separate compartments. This is actually one continuous cavity. So the orange area is uh, the main tank. That's where the refrigerant or the propellant is stored 
in a saturated vapor liquid uh, state. This means that we store the propellant, we fill it as a liquid to maximize the energy density of the system, and then it maintains its vapor pressure. So throughout the uh, use of the system, you have a constant pressure main tank. And But since we want to expand only gas out of the nozzles, we don't want liquid droplets getting in the, into the tubing since that would cause an inconsistent thrust output and cause uh, different densities of material to go out of the nozzle, which overall reduces performance. So to make sure that we only have the vapors from the main tank being sent through the nozzles, we have an intermediate tank uh, that's colored in green. We call this the plenum. So uh, like I said before, this is one continuous cavity. It just looks like different compartments since it's uh, 3D printed into the structure. So we have a, a valve between the main tank and the plenum, which will allow the plenum to replenish uh, up to a specific, uh, up to a set pressure with only gas. And then as any thruster is commanded to fire, its corresponding valve, which sits in the manifold at the top, will open and allow the gas from the plenum to go through the tubing for that nozzle and expand. And you can see for reference again that the BioSentinel machine has six thrusters. Uh, or six nozzles that are printed into the structure. These can be customized based on the needs of a mission. So you can have a different number or different location of nozzles as needed. Um, so to actually control the thruster, we have a microcontroller that controls all of those electronic solenoid valves. The controller operates based on the pressures of the main tank and the plenum, as well as fire commands given for different thrusters from the flight computer. So there's two main logic loops occurring in this uh, controller. The first is to maintain the pressure of the plenum. So if it finds that the vapor pressure in the plenum is below the specified threshold, it'll open the refill valve between the main tank and the plenum until that threshold is reached again. During this time, the thrusters cannot be fired because there isn't enough pressure. At any other time, if one or multiple of the thrusters are commanded to fire, uh, the controller will send what we call a spike hold signal. So it'll spike initially to a high, volt, uh, high 12 volt signal and then come down and hold at a lower five volt value to signal the th uh, valve to open and then hold open until the specified duration of the burn is completed. So to establish why we needed the test bed we developed, uh, we have to go into the limitations of the testing abilities of a 3D printed structure. So first, since we'd like to test these microcontrollers and valves in the loop with hardware, we need that hardware. And because of the custom nature of these missions, we need a specific engineering design unit of that mission to test any uh, controllers or valves. These aren't readily available, and we need to, this would uh, make our testing abilities extremely sp uh, specific to that mission. We can't generalize it or do multiple testing campaigns. Also, the advantages of the 3D printing, which is a compact design and sealed design, uh, limits our access to the internal. Since everything is printed into the structure, there's no machining uh, interface. So you can't easily access the flow path or tanks from outside, except for the designed uh, sensors that are integrated into the tank. So if we want to probe different points in the flow path or take different measurements, it helps to have an expanded model of this system. The custom nature of these missions, like I said, also prevents generalized testing. If you want to test at a different pressure or for a different number of valves than the current mission has, you're unable to do that if you only have hardware specific to that mission. So having a general test bed opens up our capabilities. And finally, the sensitivity and cost of these engineering design units and valves limits the amount of times we can assemble and disassemble. So uh, to have a, a separate test bed where you can swap valves in and out offers you increased testing cap capabilities and more cycles. So with the need established, we developed the goals of what this test bed would do. The first was to allow both manual, which is direct command through a desktop computer, uh, and automated, which would be the microprocessor autonomously controlling the valves, to allow both types of controls so we could do uh, testing as needed. We wanted to simulate the internals of the thruster as well as the space environment where possible, but we also recognized what variables were irrelevant to our testing needs, and we removed those from the design to simplify it. We wanted to include uh, digital sensors, which exist in the flight system, so we have pressure uh, transducers and thermistors in each of the tanks. We want to include those in the test bed, as well as having physical analog gauges for the pressure. Since this is a pressurized system that we would be working with by hand, we wanted to make sure that we could see the pressures without having to do any electronic readings. And we also wanted to design the system to modularly add or subtract valves in the future. Uh, I'll discuss this in the layout 
slide, but it shows that we can add more vowels as we need. We also want to limit the cost. This was a supplemental project in, uh, intended to expand our testing capabilities. So we want to limit the cost of the overall setup to a few hundred dollars. And we want to develop it rapidly. So we started last fall and were able to have the hardware working uh, in the middle of the spring semester. So this is a, a layout schematic of the testbed. Um, before I show the details of the schematic, I'll just note that we added the analog pressure gauges for tank, plenum, and reservoir pressures. And for each valve uh, that was being tested, we added a hand valve upstream of it so that we could enable or disable a specific branch without having to remove the valve from the system. And I'll show how we can add more thruster branches just by splitting uh, the system itself. So here you can see the main tank. Um, we have quick disconnects, which are essentially uh, interfaces that we can easily snap into to fill and drain the tanks. We have splitters uh, wherever needed in the system. The purple circles will represent physical analog, analog pressure gauges. And then the blue circle and the orange circles represent digital pressure transducers and thermistors. So we have the sensors uh, associated with the main tank right here. We have this blue valve here. This is an electronic valve that is that refill valve between the main tank and the plenum. Then we have our digital sensors and analog sensor for the plenum tank over here. And here we put two valves in parallel. Like I was saying, we can add a splitter at any of these corners to add more branches. Um, and before each of the electronic valves, we have a manual hand valve so we can enable or disable any branch of the system as needed. And then finally, we have the reservoir. So this is just a low pressure tank below uh, air pre below sea level air pressure to simulate a vacuum of space. It's not perfect, but it gets the job done. So briefly touching on the hardware that we use for our system, um, we want to simplify and use commercial parts mainly from McMaster. So we used one inch diameter stainless pipes for the tanks. Uh, you can see that we made the main tank and the reservoir tank about three times the volume of the intermediate plenum tank. This was so that when we pressurize the main tank with compressed air, uh, we could do multiple testing cycles before the pressure in that tank dropped too low. Since we were filling the plenum, having a smaller plenum tank would allow us to get more uh, testing cycles out of the main tank. We used eighth inch diameter uh, stainless steel tubing everywhere and bent, um, bent all the tubes by hand with hand tools. We added quick disconnects, like I mentioned, for simple fill and drain operations. Um, we had splitters with airtight fittings so wherever we created branches in the flow path. And we also used these fittings where we wanted to adapt the bigger diameter uh, steel pipes to the smaller diameter tubing. We had to add epoxy and thread sealant tape on those tanks since these weren't designed for pressurized components. Uh, we just had to seal those interfaces to prevent leaking. And then the solenoid valves, transducers, and thermistors, so all of the electronic components, we use from the flight design. So we use spare uh, or flight units in our test bed. Since these were the actual components we wanted to test, it made sense to use the real version, not a, not a placeholder. So this shows the final hardware uh, setup of our system. You can see that we still have wires hanging and that's the next step of integration. So to just go through the system, it's extremely similar to the layout. We have the main tank pipe here. Um, this here is the fill, the fill quick disconnect valve. This is our pressure gauge for the main tank. Uh, any red wires you see are pressure transducers or are thermistors, and this is a pressure transducer at the end. And any yellow wires you see are electronic valves. So this is that main filled valve between the main tank and plenum. And then going past the plenum, we have our sensors here, and then here are the two valves. And with the valves, you can see the small hand valves that come right before those electronic valves to protect them and, uh, like I said, enable and disable those branches. And then here we have the reservoir tank, which we pull to a low pressure through this valve at the end. So normally the test bed stands vertically. This is just another view to show you some of the hardware. Um, we use 3D printed brackets to hold all the pipes on and had specific 3D printed mounts for the valves to take the stress off of the sensitive valve stems and offload it onto the pegboard. So to operate this system, we designed it to operate up to around 50 PSI, but most of the testing was done at 30 to 35 PSI of pressure. Um, we used compressed air for the testing, so we would use an air compressor, connect that to the intake of the tank until the pressure gauge read the 30 to 35 PSI target. The reservoir was pulled to a low pressure or near vacuum using a Venturi, but obviously not a perfect vacuum. Uh, it 
that wasn't a real need of the system, so just pulling it to a low pressure served our purpose. The valves up till now have been operated by direct control from a computer. That means that we would connect those electronic valves to their processor board and then command that board directly from a desktop. Eventually, we want to bring in the microcontroller that autonomously controls that whole loop. And the valves we were, have been tested for both sustained firing, which means we held them open for a set duration of time, as well as quick impulses where we do a quick on-off cycle in less than one second. So to understand the results of any testing done on the system, it's important to compare it to the real flight system as well as the space environment. So some of the key differences are that we have a room temperature system uh, versus this vacuum of space offering no convection. So the thermal cycling is extremely different. This wasn't really relevant for us since we weren't uh, analyzing the performance of the propellant or any dynamics of the flow. So we were able to ignore this variable. Uh, like I mentioned, the reservoir was pulled to a low pressure, not a full vacuum. And as you operate the system, the gas goes into the reservoir, so the pressure of the reservoir increases over time. Uh, as long as we don't test too many cycles at once, so as long as we drain the reservoir to a low pressure uh, occasionally, this serves our needs. The sensors in our system were configured mainly for static tank measurements. So in the flight units, uh, the sensors probe directly into the tanks. So at any time when you read those digital values, you're getting uh, static pressure and temperature for the tank. However, in our system, since those sensors are downstream of the tanks, uh, they only are accurate for the tanks when everything is closed. When you have valves open and uh, there's flow, you get, more, you get dynamic measurements, but you're not measuring the tank values. This wasn't a real concern for us since our system wasn't designed to analyze any dynamic flow capabilities, and we were able to incrementally test by closing all the valves, measuring static values, and then conducting the test. We mainly neglected line losses, again, because we were not considering any flow characterization. I'll note that where the valves were for testing, we tried to keep those branches as straight and short as possible to minimize any effects caused by uh, the tubing bending or having line losses there. A uh, key difference is that we use compressed air versus the refrigerant. We only needed to test these electronic components in some sort of pressurized gas system. So compressed air made sense as it was way more accessible and safer to use than a refrigerant. Um, the pressure drop over time in the test bed tank isn't the same as a real system either. So like I mentioned, the real system, uh, meaning the 3D printed flight system, will stay at its constant pressure because it's at a liquid vapor mixture. So as the vapor from the main tank is extracted, some of the liquid will evaporate and maintain that constant pressure. In our system, on the other hand, we fill a constant, we fill a specific pressure into the tank, but as we use that gas up through testing, the main tank pressure will drop. So to accommodate this, we just monitor the main tank uh, pressure, and when it drops below a value of around 25 psi, we'll stop testing and refill that tank. It's, it's a pretty quick operation. And finally, the vertical orientation of the test bed obviously adds gravity into the system. But this wasn't a concern since the flow of the system wasn't relevant. We just wanted to test those components and make sure they operate properly. So finally, uh, for future testing, we want to connect those digital sensors into a microcontroller for autonomous control of the system. Uh, this would also allow the graduate students who are developing these electronic controllers to test different control schemes, to test, their, uh, to test different boards, and try out different algorithms for their system. We'd like to test multiple valves simultaneously. So in a flight system, more than one thruster might be firing at once. So we'd like to have the ability to operate multiple valves at the same time. And like I mentioned earlier, we want to be able to add branches. You saw that the BioSentinel example I used had six thrusters. So our current system only has two uh, thruster valves in parallel, but we've added the ability to possibly add more valves in the future once the system is uh, completely functional. And finally, uh, one potential testing application is to conduct, conduct cycling, cyclic test, cyclic testing of the valves through a program test campaign. So instead of manually having to command on and off for those valves, we can program them to cycle through multiple times over a long period of time to somewhat simulate uh, their use in space over the lifetime of a mission. Um, so that wraps up my presentation, and I'd like to acknowledge that this wasn't uh, an independent project. There was a team of four undergrads that worked together to design, build, and test the system. And I'd also like to thank the graduate students and Dr. Lightsey for their advice and help with the system. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. 
Okay, thank you very much, Sahaj. Um, are there any questions from the audience to Sahaj? Please just go ahead to ask. Okay, it seems like uh, no questions from the audience. So I have a quick question. So when you, uh, when you were working on this project, which part do you think was the most challenging part? Um, so I'll just go back to that slide just to show. Uh, so I guess there, it was a twofold, uh, the two main things that were challenging. First was just assembly. So this was my and many of the uh, team members first time working with any of any like hardware tubing. So you can see there's a lot of like irregular bends or not uh, completely straight components. So it was it was important for us to recognize what was critical to the system. So did we need to rebend a pipe or was it okay to accept uh, a not completely straight part in the interest of time and cost? So just the hardware itself was uh, a concern since we were doing everything by hand, we had to take our time and make sure everything was pre-planned, lay everything out, uh, make sure everything fit together before we started bending tubes and assembling those compression fittings, which were one-time use. And the other uh, difficulty was to assemble and integrate the electronic valves extremely carefully. Since the stems at the end are very sensitive to stress and can easily bend or snap off, which would make them unusable, uh, we had to pay special attention and then add those brackets in to offload any of the stress from there. So that was a that was something that took more time for us to design and uh, try different ideas out. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Sabrina, can you start to share your screen? Yes, Professor, give me a second. And do you see it? Yeah, I can see your screen now. Okay. Um, before I start to introduce you, and how do I pronounce your last name? Noor? Noor. Noor, okay. Great. All right. So um, our second presenter today is uh, Sabrina Noor, and uh, she is a senior in our AE school and uh, in her final semester. She has researched in the combustion lab and for the Center of the Advanced Machine Mobility. And today, she will discuss two-dimensional automatic table generation methods. Okay, Sabrina, all yours. Thank you for the introduction, Professor. Um, oh. Today, I will be talking about the 2D automatic table generation methods. Let me just, this is a slideshow view. So here is a little background. So there are many applications where slight changes can alter or disturb your applications and give you undesirable results. And an example of one of these would be that a sudden gust of wind can alter your flight path of an airplane. So you need real-time solutions to correct this immediately. And to do this, we're planning on making a two-dimensional table, which can solve and compute large amounts of data really, really fast. And this would be crucial in adjusting such disturbances. The two methods that I used today were the Jacobi method and the gauss seidel method. These are iterations method that can solve systems of linear equations. The Jacobi method can solve strictly diagonal dominant matrices. It must also have non-zeros across the main diagonal and every single diagonal value in the row needs to be greater than the sum of all the non-diagonal values, otherwise the method fail fails. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, so for this method, every diagonal value is plugged in and it is carried forward and it is not rewritten. The iteration continues till the end when you have a convergent solution. This is a brief development of the method. You use the AX is equal to B system of linear equations. You divide the A matrix into three separate parts, the D, L, and U. The D is the diagonal matrix, L is the strictly lower triangular matrix, and U is the strictly upper triangular matrix. You add them together and then you can manipulate them as needed. The final equation over here 
is what gives you the solution at the very end. And over here, xk is the gth value, and xk plus 1 would be every other iteration that's used. This is a brief breakdown. The breakdown helps in coding it. If you want to solve it by hand, then the breakdown would not be necessary. This just helps in the whole coding process. Over here, you need to find the t and c values. These are constants. As soon as you get them, you can put them into the loop. The loop will go on till you get a convergent solution at the very end. This is the first example. It was the easiest one that we did. Just to verify the results, you have the A matrix here, and the initial guess was the x naught that was taken as a zero vector. You break it up, the d, l, and u, and then you process them, get the t and c values, and those can be again used in the loop. And another thing I'd like to point out over here is that the final answer over here is very close to the exact solution that was given to us. So this was the exact solution, and the final answer is very close. It took a little longer to get to it than expected, but it was still fast enough. The second method is the gauss adel method. It is similar to the Jacobi method, but it offers a little more flexibility. It can solve the strictly diagonal dominant matrices just like the Jacobi, but it can also solve the symmetric positive definite matrices. And the same condition applies for this as well, that there must be non-zero values across the main diagonal. If there are zero values, then the system fails and the code does not operate. This is a brief development again. And just like with the previous method, the L and U need to be split up. The only difference here is that the L star is the lower triangular matrix, so you can have values on the main diagonal of the L matrix, whereas with the regular L and U, you cannot have those. And the final solution over here, sorry, the solution equations, this one right here, you need that and then you need to break it up into T and L just so you can put it into the code and have a convergent solution at the end. And with this one, every single value is rewritten. So k plus 1 will then, sorry, xk will be altered, k plus 1 will be the new one, and the xk will be forgotten afterwards. That's the only difference between the Gauss-Adel and Jacobi methods. And then the loop continues till you find the final value of the, um, the approximation. And over here, just to compare how both the methods worked, we used the same values for a, b, and x naught and we got similar values. The only difference here was that this required fewer iterations. I think I got this answer in about five iterations, whereas the Jacobi method took about 20 iterations to get to anywhere close to the exact solution. Now the block tri-diagonal structure is what we're using in, to, in the construction of the 2D table. The block tri-diagonal structure needs non-zero values everywhere besides the main diagonal, sorry, it means non-zero values on the main diagonal, the upper diagonal, and the lower diagonal. Every single, every single element needs to be zero besides these. And then this structure goes into the recursive least square method. That method starts building up the table itself. So we had to test which methods would work best with this structure, and both the Jacobi and gauss adel gave really reasonable results. So both of those methods were approved and they're viable answers. In conclusion, the Jacobi and gauss adel methods were both very similar. The only main difference is that the x value cannot be overwritten for the Jacobi, whereas it can be for the gauss adel The gauss adel method is slightly faster. And another thing I noticed was that the spectral radius needed to be less than one for both the method methods to work, otherwise you get a divergent solution. The code still runs, everything works, but the solution is not very usable. And with that, my presentation finishes. Do you have any questions for me? Are there any questions from the audience to Sabrina? Um, I have one. Go ahead. Um, so you said the matrix that you're trying to solve is block diagonal. Or sorry, block tri-diagonal, right? Yes. So, uh, is there a reason why you can't use a direct, the a direct solution method where you do like a a block 
version of the Thomas algorithm or something? We haven't really explored that algorithm. Um, we had, I think, three or four ones to explore, and these were the most viable ones. We never really had time to discuss the other algorithms, unfortunately. Okay. And this is the one that feeds into the recursive square method, which builds up the table itself. Um, the methods were just used to get to this structure, like this structure at the very end, to see if it's even usable. Does that answer your question? I think so. Thank you. Thank you. Nice presentation, by the way. I had a question as well. Mm -hmm. um, so which one of the methods is more time efficient? Um, they're both, since we weren't testing for time specifically, both of them do give you results really fast, but I would say that the gauss adele method is faster just because it requires a lesser number of iterations. But again, in, when you actually have to use them, I'm pretty sure both of them will be good because the difference is maybe a fraction of a second. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I also have a, a quick question. Uh, have you ever tested uh, the CPU time when you solve uh, one equation, for example, uh, or from the Jacobians and for the same matrix but using different method? I don't understand the question, Professor. Can you please repeat that? Uh, when you use different methods to find the Jacobian, and have you ever tested different methods and which one is the fastest one and how much CPU time you can save? So again, time wasn't really tested. That wasn't what we were going after. I did use the, besides these methods, we used one more, I forget the name, just because it was eliminated really fast. It was not giving any decent results, but we tested different sizes of matrices to see if, and we tested with all the methods to see if we had similar results. Okay, um, any other questions? All right, so we're done today. Uh, thank you very much and for both the presenters, okay? Take care.